I did not hit her. It's not true. It's bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Mark. I don't have my eyes! I didn't even miss about anything! Not once, not one time! Superman 4 The Quest for Peace is one of the worst movies ever made. I genuinely do not think there's any debate. This is a broken movie that was so chopped up in editing, so plagued with production issues, a half an hour of this movie was removed from the entire runtime. I have reviewed this before, but never in hilariosity form, and I thought to do that, I would bring on the same person who helped me get through Batman and Robin. And that would be my good friend John Flickinger, aka The Flick Pick. That was my horrible impression. Uh <laughs> Hey there guys, my name's John. I come from a magical land called the Flick Pit Channel. So thanks for having me back, Stuckman, to do another hilariosity review. The last time we talked about bat nipples, and this time we're talking about Superman, the quest for suck. I think the last time I watched this movie was in 1997 on a VHS tape at my uncle's house. And, I, yeah, whatever. So anyway, I bought the movie on Amazon. I'm not proud to say that, so... Yeah, let's just do this. This movie was made by a production company called Canon. They are a notoriously terrible production company from the 80s who made some of the worst action movies ever made. Now that's not to say those movies weren't amazing in their own way. They were trying to save their production company from going under and they thought a movie like Superman 4 could be the film that did that. And it really just made it even worse. So this movie opens with some astronauts in space and of course some sort of disaster happens and you're watching the film and you're thinking, okay, you know, this could be a movie. It's, it's possible. Possibly better than Superman 3. Who knows? We'll see what I... Oh my god! What the hell was that? Get used to that shot of Superman flying, by the way, because you're gonna see it a lot. In fact, I took the liberty of counting. Enjoy. It's mind-boggling to me that they thought no one would notice that, or at least that no one would care. We care. You guys could have done maybe two or three of them, maybe have them look this way or look up, or maybe kind of close one eye. No, the exact same one every single time. But the one that's always bothered me the most is this one right here in this subway sequence where Superman flies past this crowd of people standing in a subway. And the timing is completely wrong. You have this man, he's a heroic figure with a cape and a blue suit. He flies past these people. But they're not looking at him, they're looking behind him because they couldn't time the sequence right with the live action background. It's like, hey lady, why are you looking at the subway tiles? Superman just flew by. Now in all fairness, when discussing Superman 4, the quest for suck, we could probably stop every 25 seconds during this movie and talk shit about it. But for the sake of all of humanity and time and my lack of sleep, we're just going to start with this scene right here. So the guy from Two and a Half Men, not Charlie Sheen, the other one who no one talks about or makes memes and doesn't claim that he has tiger's blood, he helps break his uncle Lex Luthor out of prison by tricking two guards to get into a pit mobile and then driving them off of a cliff. Now pay close attention to the car, a simple stunt, but they use a shitty model dangling on a string that they probably bought at Walmart four minutes before they shot the scene. Look at the bottom of this model car right here. It's all flat and it looks like it's dangling from a string. They couldn't even buy a shitty pit mobile to push off of a cliff. They had to buy a $5 Hot Wheels toy from Walmart to do it. So there you have it. You have this little toy model dangling from a string going down into this big pit and you at least expect it to blow up with some firecrackers or something no <laughs> no 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 that would cost too much money how much money would that cost i don't know like six dollars they don't even show the car blowing up <laughs> That's what this movie is. Just lazy, shitty effects for an hour and a half. But you know what? That's not even the thing that bothers me most about this scene. It's the fact that you have these two ordinary prison guards crawling out of this pit after they were in a car, after it went off a cliff 200 feet, crashed, blew up, and they're okay. They just crawl out of this pit and they're just like, what happened? It's like, hey, why is this movie all about Superman? I get that he's super, but we have two prison guards over here who are indestructible as well. Nobody cares? 
Okay. So Clark goes back to his family farm in Smallville, and we know this because this appears. Do they really think we're that dumb that we can't tell that this is the Kent farm in Smallville? I mean, they have to let us know. And in this film's first display of very random Superman powers, he simply stares very hard at the ship that he came in as a kid, and it vanishes from existence. Let's hope he doesn't take a nice long look at Lois one day and just make her disappear. After talking to some guy who's interested in buying the Kent farm, arm, he then takes a baseball and smashes it into orbit. That ball should have shattered into a million pieces as well as the bat. I mean, hell, Benny from the Sandlot busted the guts out of a ball, and that thing was still on the grass, definitely not in space. I mean, it's only 12 o'clock, and I just ruined the whole day for us. No, you didn't. That's the most amazing thing I ever saw. Anybody got another ball? No, no. Well, then it ain't okay, because now we can't play no more. I'm just gonna think about the Sandlot for the rest of this review, if that's okay with you guys. And immediately we get another Superman rescue scene. It's almost like they just cut out all relevant character moments for just the big Superman parts. I think a guy manning the subway train starts choking or something because it's so poorly executed that I can't actually tell what the problem is. But Superman saves the day and flies off, and Lois is like, hey, Superman. You kind of look like someone. But I've always laughed my ass off at this last line. I know Superman is like the American superhero guy, yay America, but this is just too much. I'd like all the people back there to know that our subway system is still the safest and most reliable means of public transportation. Thank you. So there's this horribly boring, useless subplot about this new guy in town who's trying to take over the Daily Planet and turn it into a terrible newspaper, and his daughter with glasses the size of Superman's fist, and apparently she has a crush on Clark Kent. So there's like a weird love triangle, I guess. I don't know. It's just, it's this aspect of the movie I hated. I hate it. Watching this part of it, I was just like, go oh, just get to the dumb... Nuclear man part, please. Just anything besides this. Okay, the next thing up is the museum scene where you have a strand of Superman's hair on display showcasing just how powerful Superman is. Yeah, you have one strand of Superman's hair holding up a thousand pound weight. And then la di da di da you have the villain of the movie, Lex Luthor, come in in a shitty disguise. He just taps on the glass. It breaks. It's like, first of all, why isn't this glass bulletproof? I mean, you have an alien strand of hair. You think you might want to protect it, but that's... I'm getting ahead of myself. And then mastermind Lex Luthor pulls out a pair of bolt cutters, just ordinary bolt cutters. They're not like kryptonite and encrypted or specially made. And he just cuts Superman's hair and that's it. He takes it and he leaves. But let's back up for a second. In the realm of comic book movie logic, you can't cut Superman's hair with an ordinary pair of bolt cutters. It's like that's Superman's hair. You can't just cut that. It takes effort. It takes something special. Not just a pair of everyday bolt cutters. But this movie doesn't care. The screenwriters didn't care. They never read a comic book in their life, nor did they care to. They were just like, how can we easily progress the plot in the laziest way possible? Uh, just do that. Clip. Then we just cut away with the alarm blaring, and we never learn how Luther escaped this museum. Cameras didn't pick him up. Guards didn't pick him up. In fact, there's nobody looking for him <laughs> after he escaped from prison. So here's where the movie's actual plot starts to begin. It just so randomly inserts this whole thing about nuclear fear and that everyone has nuclear bombs. And we get to this classroom scene with two horrifically awful ADR moments. One is the teacher. Now I know you're all upset by the crisis. The best thing we can do is to try to think positively. And the other is this young boy named Jeremy, who absolutely catapults this film's plot into the stratosphere of dumb by wanting Superman to rid the world of nuclear weapons. I tell you, I'd write a letter to that would do some good. Who, Santa Claus? No, Superman! I know who could do some good. Who, Santa Claus? No, Superman! So Clark gets really stressed out about this whole nuclear weapon thing, and he decides to tell Lois that he's Superman by jumping off of a roof with her, and then we get this friggin' scene where they float around all over the world, absurd amounts of distances are traversed in seconds, shots are thrown all over the place telling us, well, now they're here, well, now they're there. Lois is wearing a dress, she never appears different. Now listen, guys, if you guys are aspiring filmmakers or you wanna work in special effects someday, Watch this scene right here. That's how you don't do green screen. Now before I say what I'm going to say, I understand that this movie is called Superman. I understand it's about a man who can fly. I get that. 
But can Lois Lane fly in this movie? I didn't think so. So why the fuck is she flying? Just look at a few of these scenes right here. Lois Lane is flying side by side with Superman. He's holding her hand, then he lets go, she continues to fly, and it's just like, what the fuck is this? In all reality, Lois Lane would be like this, holding onto Superman's hand as she's dangling. At this point in the movie, it's no longer a Superman movie. It's Peter Pan. Someone sprinkled pixie dust on Lois Lane and she's she's flying to Neverland. So Supes decides to do the nuclear weapon thing and he gives this big speech. And Christopher Reeve giving a speech, it's great. He is Superman to me. This is the one positive thing about this movie. Christopher Reeve, he's great. He is Superman as far as I'm concerned. And it's cool seeing him give a speech, but it's like, who cares, you know? And then we get this montage where he somehow knows where all these nukes are. How does he actually know this? Here's all the nukes. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there. Okay, fly! The best part of this whole sequence is that he creates a giant net in space filled with nuclear weapons. <laughs> Where'd he get this giant net? He probably made that with his weird ass Superman 4 powers. He collects all the nukes and he launches them into the sun. Now look, I don't know too much about space and the science around the sun, but I can't imagine launching every nuclear weapon on Earth into the sun would really be a good idea. It'd be a pretty terrible idea, I think. So now we get more of Luther planning his evil plans, but the best part of this scene are the supporting actors in it. We have Jim Broadbent and Porkins from Star Wars and the top men guy from Raiders and Lieutenant Eckhart from Batman. That guy is the craziest guy. Like, look at all those roles. He's Porkins. He's just sitting there in Superman 4. He's just sitting there. I've got a problem here. I'm in Superman 4. I can't hold it! So Luther's plan is that with the DNA in Superman's hair strand, he will create a being from the sun called Nuclear Man to fight and kill Superman. And it works! Nuclear Man is born from the sun. A literal fetus sprouts from the sun. <laughs> Within seconds, fling! He's got these long silver nails, long blonde hair, and a Dumbass costume. The film does not care to explain how Luther did this. He just did it. Now, who is Nuclear Man? Well, he's the yin to the yang of Superman. He's just a shitty version of Superman who has bleach blonde hair, he looks like a Chippendales dancer, and he covers himself in baby oil. Yeah, to sum it up, Nuclear Man kind of looks like the shittier version of Master Sensei of Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid. So Nuclear Man somehow knows to come to Luther. He just comes right to where Luther is, lands, and he's like, Hello, I am Nuclear Man. Destroy Superman. By the way, that's Gene Hackman's voice. And we're instantaneously shown Nuclear Man's weakness. When he gets out of the sunlight, he just powers down. I mean, Luther even flat out says, That's his vulnerability. That's the only way he can be stopped. Could they be any more obvious about how Superman will eventually beat Nuclear Man? Also, what a horrible weakness. You can only fight in the sun? I mean, if the shade passes over this guy, he's just like, mm. I could beat Nuclear Man. All I'd have to do is take a really big branch of a tree and just hold it over him for a second and he'd be like, mm. So now we get what's known as a comedy scene where Superman and Clark have to be in the same place at the same time. And I honestly got so bored here that I started doodling in my notepad. So Luther calls Superman on that high frequency sound that only Superman can hear. And he somehow knows to tell Superman this. Look to your left, tall dark answer. I'm gonna blow 20 stories off that building. How would he even remotely know which direction to tell Superman to look? He has no idea where Superman is. This writing is horrendous. There's no excuse for that. Superman could be anywhere. He could be in Alaska. He could be in Antarctica. He could be in China. He could be anywhere. How would you know where to tell him where to look? That's so bad. Now let's talk about the epic scene in Superman 4 where Nuclear Man and Superman go head to head. These two titans of godlike power collide for the first time. And what happens? They sort of awkwardly hug each other. It looks like one's trying to make out with the other one, and then they fall off of a building. And then we get some ass juice inducing flying sequences once again throughout this movie. Some random stuff happens, but then something amazing happens. It's at this point in the movie, for the first time ever, we're introduced to Superman's secret power. And what is it? Not only does Superman have heat vision, he also has wall rebuilding vision. That's right, Superman can rebuild walls by looking at them. Huh? Yeah. And you know what the saddest thing about this is? I'm pretty sure about 90% of the FX budget went into this scene. Just rebuilding a fucking wall. 
Oh, Superman 4. And then after that, some more random stuff happens. Nuclear Man kind of just irritates Superman by picking up stuff and putting it down. It's just like, what are you doing, dude? Why do you exist? And then the most amazing thing happens. It's where Nuclear Man has long silver fake fingernails and he bitch scratches Superman. Yeah, he doesn't punch him. He doesn't choke him out. He bitch scratches him. There's no excuse for this. A gigantic slow motion disaster in which two men are just sort of like, fondling each other. That's all this is. This might as well be like foreplay for an eventual Superman nuclear man porno. For goodness sakes, the Incredible Hulk show with Bill Bixby had better fight scenes. This entire scene is so horrendously unfinished and broken. Superman lives with Nicolas Cage is more finished than this movie. And they didn't even make that. This fight scene ends with Superman getting scratched on the neck by nuclear man. <laughs> which somehow just makes him start withering away. He starts losing his powers because of a scratch from a nuclear man. And again, another crazy time jump occurs and the only thing letting us in on what's happening is Lois's exposition. And then another crazy time jump happens, another one with Clark withering away like some old man looking for that green crystal that he got when he was a kid. Now here is where the film absolutely positively tanks in every way. It was awful already, but now Nuclear Man looks at a picture of the Daily Planet newspaper and sees this new girl, Lacey, and decides that he wants to find her. He's got a crush on this girl now. And yet another crazy time jump happens and Superman just appears in Metropolis. He's back now because he found the green crystal. Why was his sickness such a problem if all he had to do was go crawl in a hole, pick up a green crystal and that's it. That's all we see. He's all old. He's like, green crystal. And then he's Superman again. That's it. That's all he had to do was just pick up a green crystal. And now he's Superman again. Honestly, this is unbelievable. The fact that this even saw the light of day is astounding to me. So Nuclear Man is now in Metropolis because he wants to find Lacey. I honestly want to know what he wants to do. What is his plan? Is he planning on like getting some? Because uh, it's not going to happen. I mean, I, w w you, you were born from the sun like a couple days ago. For all I know, maybe it was six months ago with how this film's storytelling is. And he starts destroying things and hurting people and Superman says this. Stop! Don't do it! The people! Oof, that was some terrible line delivery. Stop! Don't do it! The people! Stop! Don't do it! The people! Stop! Don't do it! The people! So Superman tricks Nuclear Man into going inside an elevator and then drops him off on the moon. And you really gotta love those space curtains the moon has. Man, this movie actually got released! Okay, I think it's that time. We're almost at the climax of the movie. And what is the climax of Superman 4? Well, just get ready. So once again in Superman 4, Nuclear Man and Superman clash head to head. And well, I, I guess I'm overstating something right there because here's what happens. <laughs> And then Superman and Nuclear Man proceed to keep fighting and it's like two drunks in an alleyway. They just kind of hug each other and like caress each other and a little bit of cuddling happens. And then Nuclear Man plants Superman like a carrot. And then what does Nuclear Man do once he almost defeats Superman? Well, he just flies off, he goes back to Earth, kidnaps some chick, and then takes her up into space. Now keep in mind, Nuclear Man is Nuclear Man. He can handle space, but this everyday average chick, she can't. Like, why is she not dead by this point? Why has her head not exploded? She's in space right now. Honestly, there is too much shit happening right now to even focus on. While this girl is just floating around in space wearing her high heels and skirt, Superman moves the moon to block the sun. So Nuclear Man loses all of his powers instantaneously, which of course we all knew was going to happen. Honestly, if Superman were to move the moon and obstruct the orbit around the earth and everything, we'd have tidal waves and flooding and all kinds of absurd weather problems on this earth. But who cares about any of that? Because who really cares? 
Just, just let the movie end. He drops Nuclear Man inside of a power plant, powering the city absurdly. I guess he saves Lacey and she's like, wow, I can breathe in space. So Supes gives a horrifically edited speech. You can tell it was probably supposed to be a lot longer than it actually is. He captures Luther, of course, and we get the exact same reused shot from Superman the movie from 1978 ending our film. That's right, they couldn't even do another one. They used the same shot. They just color corrected it to make it look slightly different. Insanity. <sighs> so that's Superman 4 The Quest for Peace, a terribly executed film where they had no money whatsoever and it's a film with nothing but special effects shots every 10 minutes. And if you don't have the budget or talent or time to even try to attempt these effects, it's probably best you don't make a movie with them in it. But no one working on Superman 4 gave a shit and they said, no one cares, let's do it. We have $6, let's make a movie. And Superman 4 The Quest for Peace, along with many other movies that came out around this time period, is the reason that the studio behind this movie went out of business. The studio also made Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone. I like that movie. So I can't really talk shit about it. Alrighty, so that's my take on Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. And as much as I hated watching this movie again, I still had fun making the video and hopefully I never have to talk about the movie again. I think I got all the hate out and I feel better. So anyway, yeah, thanks for watching guys and thanks Chris for having me back on your channel. I really appreciate it. My name's John and I'll see you guys next time. Guys, this movie's horrible. I hate it. John and I hate it. Everyone hates this movie. It's terrible. Thanks for watching our Hilariosity review of Superman 4 The Quest for Who Gives a Shit. Please subscribe to John's channel if you get a chance. He makes really great content and thank you John for coming along on this video. It was a ton of fun. And speaking of really crappy Superman things, I hope you guys check out my Hilariosity review I've already done for Supergirl, the 1984 movie, as well as my retro rewind of Superman 64, one of the worst video games ever made, where I actually sat down and tried to play it. Stay tuned next week because it is going to be a retro rewind Sunday. I'm not sure what it'll be. In my new release reviews this week, I'll let you know what it's going to be. Thank you guys so much as always for watching and if you like this, you can click right here and get stuck -benized. <laughs>